Mr. Putin said yesterday that uh, they view Afghan Taliban oh, as an ally against very terrorism. Very what do you make of this? Very interesting statement. And there were indications that Russians uh, were, I think, coming closer to uh, extend some kind of recognition to Taliban government in Afghanistan, as the Chinese have done. Is this not a de facto recognition? It is. It is. Uh, my understanding is that SCO could potentially be a very important forum where all the countries mm. which have uh, concerns from Afghanistan, mm. but also have tangible incentives mm. to offer Kabul to behave and act responsibly, can collectively influence Kabul Absolutely. Assistance. I fully agree with you because economic incentives should lure uh, the Taliban government to, to change their uh, you know, policies. I think one argument which is often uh, used by Pakistan in Washington mm -hmm. is that uh, the US should not look at Pakistan from either Indian or Afghan lens. Mm. Should we expect the same from Moscow? Moscow is no longer looking at Pakistan from uh, from uh, Afghan perspective or Afghan prison or Indian prison. I don't think so. So is there an intelligence sharing mechanism within SCO? Yes, SCO2? yes, yes. Which through, could help through rats. reinforce the city efforts? Yes, through rats they are doing it. And then we, we do, uh, they hold uh, uh, city related exercises. Welcome to another episode of uh, V News English Perspectives. Viewers, today uh, we are going to discuss uh, a very important organization which is uh, fast emerging as one of the most influential international multilateral forums in the world, which is uh, creating hopes in the developing world and Asia Pacific, but some concerns in the Western capitals, SCO. You've uh, heard about the Astana uh, resolution. So we are going to discuss uh, with an authority on uh, SCO and more importantly, uh, China, um, Ambassador Masood Khalid, uh, who has served with distinction for almost four decades in Pakistan's foreign service uh, at uh, very important missions, including China, Malaysia, and several others. So thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Excellency. So Excellency, what is SCO? Uh, in the Western capitals, it is seen as a, a multilateral alternative to NATO or something which is emerging as a challenge to the post Second World War Western led world order. Is it a accurate characterization? Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. I don't think that that is a correct characterization of this organization. You are right absolutely that it is evolving and it has become more robust. And if you go back into history, you would know that uh, this started as Shanghai 5 in 1996 after the dissolution of the former Soviet Union. And of course, uh, after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was, you know, chaos and Central Asian republics emerged and new issues cropped up. So at that point in time, it was thought by China and Russia to sort of initiate this process. And that is how Shanghai 5 emerged in 1996 with five members, China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And later on in 2001, the organization, this body mutated into Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, uh, with China and Russia in the lead. Primarily, uh, the purpose of this organization, the creation of this organization was to focus on uh, disputes uh, security related disputes and problems, issues, terrorism, extremism, and separatism. 
because there was a chaos after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So they wanted to cope with that new dynamic, new situation. And <clears throat> so the focus was on these three, what they call three evils, separatism, terrorism, and extremism, as well as there are border issues and water disputes between the Central Asian Republics. So they didn't, they didn't want primarily China and Russia. China also felt, you know, uh, a challenge on its uh, border with the Central Asian Republics. It borders, you know, uh, eight countries. Uh, so that is why it was decided that we should give, uh, you know, that uh, strength and that vibrancy to this organization. So the focus was on these issues and border disputes, for example, between Kyrgyzstan and, uh, you know, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and <coughs> Kyrgyzstan. So 2001, this SU was created with the addition of Uzbekistan, so six countries. And now, uh, you know, we had this Astana summit 2024. This is why I think the 23rd summit. And uh, your question that it is being raised or it is being sort of, uh, you know, established as a counter to NATO, I don't think so because it does not have, although there are 10 members now, with the addition of Belarus uh, day before yesterday. But I don't think it is. it should be perceived as a uh, counterweight to NATO. NATO is, you know, uh, almost what, 32 members now with the addition of Finland and Sweden. But that is one aspect. Mm. <clears throat> but when you um, uh, notice two mm. aspects, mm. one uh, focus on security, mm -hmm. the second you know, as we look at what came out of Astana, the emergence of a fair multipolar world order. Mm -hmm. Now, this seems to be an antithesis to how the Western world has uh, imagined the world to be and maintained the mm -hmm. status quo in terms of distribution of power. Mm -hmm. So, do you think, isn't, no, but the isn't point it a is, challenge to the no, Western-led world order? No, no, you are right. But the point is that the status quo is being challenged. It's changing. It's no longer a unipolar world. Uh, after the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, we saw the unipolar movement. It's no longer there. Multiple centers of power are emerging. And the rise of China itself, you know, uh, it is, I mean, the geopolitical context, if you take into account, then, of course, this uh, alliance or this partnership between Russia and China is very important now. And this also drives the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, no doubt. Primarily, SEO is uh, a regional organization, intergovernmental body uh, with, you know, political, economic and security pillars. And, and if, you, uh, if you see its... Uh, uh, sort of expanse, then practically 80% of the uh, Eurasian landmass, 40% population of the world, you know, China, India, and I think it's contributing about 25 to 26% of global GDP. So that way it is important, it is an important entity. But uh, your question that the status quo is being challenged, is being questioned, yes. They, I mean, international order is undergoing tremendous change and it's very fast change. And especially after the war in Ukraine, uh, the, 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 uh, the Russians and the Chinese have come closer because they feel threatened in the wake of this, uh, what I call or, or is generally called dual containment strategy of the United States. But if I were to, uh, you know, briefly interrupt you to uh, expand further on this mm -hmm. very important point, mm -hmm. uh, one notices a clear desire and a common desire between um, China, mm -hmm. Russia, mm -hmm. and also to some extent India, uh, who expect or seek uh, their rightful place in a multipolar world order. Mm -hmm. So is it not uh, by default a challenge, perhaps not direct 
to the status quo in which the western power wants to delay the emergence or resurgence of alternative uh, nature no but the point is that you cannot uh, reverse or arrest a historical phenomena i mean nobody would have anticipated 40 years ago 50 years ago the rise of china and you know what is perceived in the west or by the united states as a challenge to its supremacy mm. or its preeminence but this this uh, this change is already taking place it is very much there and it is acknowledged by independent scholars and academics researchers that this change is taking place and the world is becoming multipolar or i would call we are actually heading towards bi multipolarity that if chinese economy were to surpass the economy of the united states by 2030 or whatever these are the projections yes then i think it's almost there that they are co equals not in terms of perhaps uh, military parity or technological parity but china is uh, you know uh, developing very fast and is acquiring that sophistication it's in, in it's a multi domain progress and development which is taking place as far as china is concerned what i'm trying to uh, assert here and say is that us policy of china's containment and after this ukraine war whatever you may call it invasion uh, russian invasion of ukraine their alignment is now closer and natural and and and, and naturally natural because coming back to su now the central asian republics have also been divided they wanted after the dissolution of the soviet union they wanted to somehow you know uh, distance away themselves from from the russian stranglehold but that was not possible because of the economic interdependence and energy uh, you know supply lines etc uh, at the same time they also developed their relations with the united states with the west kazakhstan uzbekistan uzbekistan gave an air base to Uh, to united states similarly i think uh, tajikistan also so what i'm trying to say is that they tried to balance their relationship both the russian federation and the united states but <laughs> the overarching shadow of russia is still exist as far as central asia is concerned now all central asian republics are landlocked and there is a quest for connectivity for economic empowerment for development so these and china is emerged as a player as a key player in the region in terms of developmental process of central asian republics so you can see that what you described as you know the status quo status quo is slowly changing or is being challenged all these central asian republics iran turkey pakistan our emphasis on geoeconomics as a pivot of foreign policy so they are all interested in promoting regional economic cooperation and connectivity 15 years ago or 20 years ago you know it very well that the central asian republics would not look at pakistan to reach out to the indian ocean now they are seeking us out to use our ports port of gwadar so this is a shift which is taking place thinking is changing paradigm shift is taking place and kind of a new i would say excess is evolving this region uh driven by china because even in su china uh, is uh, a key player followed by russia and then all other countries barring india all other countries interested in promoting regional economic cooperation and focusing on issues of security namely terrorism drug trafficking human trafficking and related crime syndicates you know which which operate Uh, under the garb of uh, these militant outfits and this and that 
So that is focus. So I think Pakistan, as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, it's a it's a good opportunity for us because South Asia, as you know, has been least integrated economically. We should look towards West and we should take advantage. We should leverage our geographical position to take advantage of uh, whatever connectivity projects and, you know, and, and, you know, our role in, for example, in combating terrorism. I mean, uh, SEO countries hold their counter-terrorism, uh, anti-terrorism exercises in, in Pakistan, in Pabi. So taking advantage of the experience and the knowledge we have gained in the fight against terrorism. So these are the uh, benefits of the dividends uh, which, which Pakistan uh, can derive. Okay, that, that brings me to two further questions that uh, mm. what are the uh, convergences and divergences mm. that you can identify mm. are emerging between Russia and China in this current geopolitical dynamic? There are more convergences than divergences. Because, and what are those? Can you identify a few? Because first of all, they are both in close partnership against what they uh, described as an intrusive, you know, policy uh, of the United States. Both are being cornered. So they think and they have realized, you know, they, they, they have. Yeah, been, I mean, the U.S. national security strategy hmm. describes China as the biggest competitor. Yes. And Russia as the biggest threat. Uh, as the revisionist power. Yes. So, so this is a motivating factor for both China and Russia to align with each other. Enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, something like that. And I mean, in the current uh, scenario, of course. And when they say that our partnership has no limits, they mean it. President Xi Jinping <coughs> and President Putin, have, I am forgetting how many times they have met in the last two or three years. Uh, frequent meetings. And even after the Sastana summit, uh, they came out very clearly yes. against, uh, you know, external interference and they have called for unity in the ranks of SU member states, etc. So the point is that this alignment uh, is playing out not only in our part of the world, in Central Asia or in South Asia, also in, in, in European theater. So uh, this is the current uh, situation or current scenario as I understand. And, and the but Central Asian republics, yes, I want to make uh, this point. Uh, as I said, Central Asian republics are uncomfortable taking sides, as most of the smaller countries are. Uh, but they look at China and Russia being a past master. Huh? They look at China as a provider or as a potential contributor to their socio-economic development. The development deficit which existed since the time of Soviet occupation, now that is that is changing. For example, Kazakhstan is the entry point or exit point for BRI for China. From China, about nine to 10,000 cargo trains are plying between Europe and China, crossing Kazakhstan, this route. So this this region is very, very important for... But for, that for, makes sense that China has the money, mm -hmm. it has the resources, the will, the technology mm -hmm. to help uh, several developing countries. And China needs them themselves. because China is getting energy supplies from them. But what does Russia offer these countries? Russia, Russia has been... A what does Russia offer SCO? You see, many old pipelines of these Central Asian republics go uh, pass through Russia. Hence their dependence on Russia. Then Russia is a, how would I describe? You know, an energy superpower. Energy superpower and sitting on their head. Yes. Central Asia. It is still enjoys some influence there. Influence. A lot of influence in Central Asia. And I mean, Russia is, spoking, is spoken uh, all over uh, Central Asian Republic. Mr. Putin uh, said yesterday, that uh, they view Afghan Taliban Ooh. as an ally 
against very terrorism. Very what do you make of this? Very interesting statement. And there were indications that Russians uh, were, I think, coming closer to uh, extend some kind of recognition to Taliban government in Afghanistan, as the Chinese have done. Is this not a de facto recognition? It is. It is. It is. And it may lead to, uh, I may be wrong, but a similar arrangement as the Chinese have worked out with Taliban, you know, their ambassador being in Beijing. So you may see. So what should Kabul expect from Moscow? Well, uh, they are getting a space. Uh, they, 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 their, their legitimacy uh, is being sort of established in the region. Although Afghanistan is a problem in the context of, you know, these projects and connectivity and in regional economic integration. But if slowly through these diplomatic moves, Afghanistan is brought into the mainstream, uh, you know, regional mainstream, there are problems. Problems are, for example, between Tajikistan and Taliban government in Afghanistan. We also have our own problems. So these kind of problems do crop up. There is not a unanimity of view as far as uh, what kind of relationship, uh, you know, uh, uh, SCO countries should be having with, with this government in, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, that is a question mark right now, I think. But when we discuss Afghanistan, I want your co quick comment on uh, the three, uh, you know, aspects of it, which are somewhat contradictory. Uh, the view in Pakistan is that uh, Kabul is uh, falling short of its commitments uh -huh. under the Doha Agreement uh -huh. Uh -huh. and have been too tolerant and sympathetic to number of terror outfits operating out of its territory. Right. But at the same time, our Prime Minister seems to be advocating its case for greater international engagement. And you see an exceptional statement of goodwill coming from President Putin. How do you add this up? We had a contact group on Afghanistan, SCO contact group. But I think that that has been dormant. Mm -hmm. In my view, <clears throat> I think that should be reactivated because we should try to find a regional solution to this Afghanistan problem. And SEO could be a useful for us? SEO would be a useful platform. Mm -hmm. But as I said, there are problems between the, not only between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, on account of what you uh, correctly alluded to, TTP factor and all that. Tajikistan and, and Taliban government also don't, you know, Uzbekistan is also concerned that these terrorist outfits, uh, what is that called? Uh, uh, IUM or something. IMU. 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 Yes. Is, is some elements are based in Afghanistan. So all these countries have a common concern uh, on Afghanistan being a, you know, a safe heaven to create destabilization in all these countries. Uh, ETIM, for example, for China is a threat. Russia, we, we, why, why should we forget that in May there was a huge, uh, you know, that uh, terrorist <coughs> act in, in that concert uh, in, in some city of Russia. And the Tajiks were involved in that. So, so what, it's a very complex uh, so situation. So SCO, mm -hmm. based on what you've just said, uh, my understanding is that SCO could potentially be a very important forum where all the countries... Mm -hmm which have uh, concerns from Afghanistan, mm. but also have tangible incentives mm. to offer Kabul to behave and act responsibly, can collectively influence Kabul to, you know, help address their security concerns, but in return also benefit from uh, their responsible behavior and offer some sort of economic Absolutely. assistance. I fully agree with you because economic incentives should lure uh, the Taliban government to, to change their, uh, you know, policies. Uh, well, you know, the problem in Afghanistan, there are factions, there is a Kandahar faction and there is a Kabul faction and, you know, uh, there are divergence of... So uh, there can be an Asian solution to Afghanistan problem? I think there is a regional solution. And uh, if we leave India for the time being, side, because India uh, is not cooperating in the context of BRI, it has its own policy as a counterweight uh, to China, you know, so, uh, if, uh, so that is, if you leave that apart, 
in, in, in this region, Southeast Asia, where Pakistan is located. Pakistan, Iran, Turkey. And look at the composition. Uh, uh, let, me, let me complete this argument. Central Asian Republics, China, Russia. All are, now Belarus also. All are unanimous that SEO cannot actualize its true potential if problem continues in Afghanistan. Hence, all the more logical that these regional countries should sit together. And I think China has good influence over, over Taliban regime because they are offering economic incentives and this and that. Russia also has. If, if Russia goes forward and, you know, gives some kind of recognition. Uh, so I think that should help, you know, reaching some kind of uh, an understanding with the, Tabl uh, with the Kabul government to change its policies. Very it's, interesting. It's, it, is, it is not, they, we should not expect a transformation. But because then, it, is, it is more ideological there, you know, absolutely. issues. Absolutely. But uh, I want your uh, comment on uh, the fact that uh, the SEO summit took place within a few days mm -hmm. of the Do Doha process. Mm -hmm. So not achieving much progress from at, in Doha uh, would logically force Kabul to be more interested in whatever SEO offers them. Uh, the, the, the Afghan delegation gave a positive uh, assessment of the Doha meeting. Okay. I, I read the comments. They gave positive assessment of the Doha, uh, you know, what were deliberations. What were their expectations from no, Doha? No, I don't process? know. They said that this very, co we found the Western countries quite understanding of our issues, but they are not prepared to budge on those issues, you know, human rights. Because they are very issues. demanding as yeah, well. They are very demanding. But if, but the problem is the United States, it has frozen their assets. Even one step of defreezing their assets, I think, would force, in my view, change, uh, you know, the thinking in, in Kandahar or Kabul. But that is not happening. So these countries are countries, and I think, I mean, I can be wrong, but Pakistan should also start reflecting that if China has done it, and if Russia has is about to make a move, in, in give, extending de facto recognition, what should be Pakistan's policy? Shouldn't we review our policy, present policy? Because after all, we have historical linkages with Afghanistan. It's our immediate neighbor. And we can't afford to, uh, you know, uh, have a hostile, uh, you know, uh, Afghanistan. So, uh, but that is, SU, I think provides a good platform. And it is, it is not uh, moving with leaps and bounds. It is not very speedy because of the internal contradictions within, within these uh, SEO member states, as I alluded to. For example, India and Pakistan, India and China, some Central Asian republics having their own you know, disputes and issues water disputes, sometimes the river flows are blocked, sometimes the electricity supplies are snapped. This happens between the <laughs> republics. So, uh, but I think the greater aim or the bigger aim that no, we should not be losing on time and we should move towards improving uh, our, our, our capacity for development and overcoming the development deficit. I think that is the driving force in Central Asia now. And that is where an opportunity lies for Pakistan. If you want, I can talk about it a little more. But my point is that slowly China is driving this. So this is becoming an economic, security, political, and defense-oriented mechanism. Now, there are regular military exercises amongst SU member states since 2017. And I was reading somewhere, the magazine Diplomat reported in 2017 or 18. The, you know, they have a, a, a counterterrorism yes. structure, RATS. Yes. Uh, Pakistan in, has been participating uh, in that. In, yes. in Tashkent. According to Diplomat, through this 
intelligence sharing uh, and counterterrorism CT related cooperation. SCO member states have foiled 600 terrorist acts. So is there an intelligence sharing mechanism within SCO? Yes, SCR? yes, yes. Which through, could help through rats. reinforce the CT efforts? Yes, through rats they are doing it and then we, we do uh, they hold uh, uh, CT related exercises. So it could be something. There is a defense minister's mechanism also. So it could be something similar in the making to I-5. They say, <laughs> they, say, they say that it's not a military alliance. The leaders of SCO declare it not to be a military alliance. So your first question that it is, first of all, it cannot be a counterweight or, you know, a, a body which is, uh, confronting or, or would confront NATO, not possible. Uh, it's not like that, but it is moving towards, slowly moving towards an entity uh, which focuses not only on economic development of the region, of the member states, but also addresses political and security related issues. So basically and the common concern yes. of all these Central Asian Republics, China, Russia is terrorism, drug trafficking. And that is also our concern because we are also seeing the resurgence of, you know, militancy. So basically you're saying SCO uh, is emerging as a forum mm -hmm. to seek uh, regional solutions to regional problems. Regional solutions to regional problems. And uh, they have also, by the way, they are also working, although the progress is slow, uh, they, they launched about 20 projects, uh, you know, uh, on, on the economic side, telecommunications, energy and transportation, etc. I am not sure what the progress is now. But if they move in this direction, and we, you know, we have parallel initiatives like CASA 1000, oh, yeah. And Carrick related north south, uh, what is that called? Uh, corridor, transportation corridor. So, all these, when you combine all these initiatives, although the progress is slow, because first of all, the economic, uh, uh, the, 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 the developmental level of these Central Asian republics is not the same. For example, Tajikistan is the poorest, while Kazakhstan may be the richest. So, that also plays against, uh, you know, uh, a sort of, for example, we, we, we don't see a SU bank yet. There is a talk about SU bank, but I don't think that is that is actualized as far as my information goes. Uh, so all these initiatives and proposals are on the table. Some are being implemented, but the progress is slow. But if you move in that direction and this entity sort of pivots around these three pillars, economic, uh, developmental oriented and security. If there is a broad consensus of this and in Afghanistan comes on board. So I think this, because Turkey is also, for example, interested. And look at the composition. That's, I think I forgot to mention. Composition of SU. 10 member states, 14, I think, dialogue partners. And if I'm not wrong, three observers. Yes. So after Belarus, Mongolia and Afghanistan may be the next to become members, right? But among the dialogue partners, look at the interest from Cambodia to Bangladesh and about five or six Middle Eastern countries. Yes. So obviously, if Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Egypt, big countries, important countries, if they look at SU, as a potential mechanism and a platform for you know uh, com for 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 economic development and regional integration and energy related cooperation. Central Asia is rich in oil so, and so, gas. So Russia I is Russia is the superpower. So you mentioned uh, geoeconomics. Mm -hmm. Geoeconomics, but uh, I would like your uh, Frank. Uh, take on uh, the interplay between geopolitics and geoeconomics because there are at least four different countries mm -hmm. which are seeking and developing uh, different uh, trans-regional corridors. Mm -hmm. PRI is one mm -hmm. led by China. Mm -hmm. Russia is developing its own corridors. Turkey has proposed some corridors with, uh, with the Middle East. 
India has also in the last G20 summit proposed another trans-regional corridor. So do you think these uh, corridors would allow this region to benefit from these multiple opportunities or see it as a geo-economic competition? It depends if geopolitics does not overshadow geoeconomics. Has it ever done that? Uh, it does. It does. And if there are conflicts, if there are hostilities, uh, then of course things can, you know, uh, go haywire. But uh, but we have to evaluate the success of these respective initiatives as well. I mean, BRI so far has done perhaps it is the best performing. Uh, amongst all the corridors, all the initiators, IMAC is over there, I2, U2 is, you know, because it's conflict in Palestine, Gaza. So, so far BRI has done well. Russia does not have that prowess or that potential. Uh, it has a Eurasian Economic Union. But now they are talking of, uh, uh, of, of sort of, uh, how would I say, combining the effort. Eurasian Economic Eurasian, Union yeah. with BRI. Yes. Uh, some kind of synergy somewhere. Because when you compare BRI with Eurasian Economic Union, of course, BRI has partner countries about 150 or thereabout. So, uh, one would wish that all these corridors, because if the aim and the objective is the same, to promote more regional connectivity, economic integration, then at some point in time in future, God knows what happens. But then they should, there should be a convergence somewhere. But the region is definitely going, I tell you, in my view, in the direction of better connectivity uh, and kind of Asian-ness, you know, as uh, I think you had mentioned. And let Asia decide its own future. Let Asia decide its own destiny. So, uh, this is, I think, the thrust uh, amongst the uh, leadership of all these countries also. We are also, you know, trying to leverage our geography uh, to, to get benefit because imagine if our ports of Karachi, uh, Gwadar is not fully functional, but our port of Karachi is used for transit trade. We get royalty, we get transit fee. And we badly need foreign exchange now. But, but I want you, because you have been an eyewitness and one of the diplomatic architects of uh, CPEC, if I may say no, so. I, I never claimed that. Uh, no, you are being very modest, I think. But uh, don't you think that besides uh, CPEC, hmm. with the emergence of so many exciting and fascinating trans-regional corridors, Pakistan should uh, explore opportunities in these uh, corridors uh, to not only invite greater investment, but also benefit from a partnership with other countries as well. I think that's what we are trying to do. That's what we are trying to do. Prime Minister in Astana, he met Turkish President, Azerbaijan President, three of them, and they, they, they talked of trilateral cooperation. Turkey is very supportive. Turkey is a great friend of Pakistan. Azerbaijan is a good friend of Pakistan. So we are, I think our foreign policy is already focused on that. We are trying to explore all possible opportunities where uh, of mutual cooperation and mutual complementarity. So that we are doing and it's a good policy. They, look, this is incremental. Foreign policy is not an event. It's a process. You, you achieve things over time. Things do not happen overnight. A crisis can erupt overnight, but developments in your favor or, or, or your gains take time. So I think that uh, Pakistan uh, is very fortunate to, to be in the center, to be at the center of these three or four regions. And in, you know, uh, right, actually in the middle. Uh, and, and if Pakistan uh, has a clarity about its future direction, we can, I think we can benefit a lot because now Russia, for example, Russia-Pakistan relations were not that good in the past. When the last 12-15 years, we have moved forward. Now, Russia is also keen. Russia understands and realizes Pakistan's importance. Pakistan is an important country in South Asia. Uh, in South Asian equation, whichever power, superpower, big power, major power are neighbors. 
they cannot be dismissive of pakistan so and then you have you are a big country population of 245 million so we should explore all possible you know avenues for collaboration and our destiny lies with our neighborhood we cannot divorce ourselves from our neighboring countries i think one argument which is often uh, used by pakistan in washington mm -hmm. is that uh, the us should not look at pakistan from either indian or afghan lens mm. should we expect the same from moscow moscow is no longer looking at pakistan from uh, from uh, afghan perspective or afghan prism or indian prism i don't think so okay i can be wrong but my view is that we should not be too apprehensive as far as india russia relations are concerned likewise one should not be too apprehensive about pakistan china relations india russia relations have existed for the last 70 years 75 years similarly pakistan china relations have have, have developed and grown in the last 70 years so if us is not concerned about the close security economic relations between moscow and india mm -hmm. then why should the us be concerned about beijing pakistan relations it should not be it should not be i think that is a concern which is at least i do not understand there is no logic we are pakistan china relationship is not at the expense of pakistan relationship with other countries and it is not against the interest of any other country i mean if china is supporting us in cpac that is for our development we are not going to uh, sort of you know come up with some kind of uh, an alliance or a partnership which which works against a particular country or against a particular power pakistan is pakistan's foreign policy is you know uh, for peace and stability in the region what so, would pakistan so, gain so you're saying pakistan's foreign policy mm. as someone who has uh, been part of it for four decades um uh, becoming more mature and careful it is mature from an alliance relationship to a careful and balanced partnership with different countries see, on bilateral level uh, the time of alliances has gone security alliances has gone we seek partnerships on the basis of mutual benefit and relationship this is a common question which is asked you know pakistan how do the balance there is no balance as such we deal with countries independent of each other we have an independent Uh, policy as far as our relations with china are concerned we have an independent policy in terms of our relations with the united states it's not a zero sum game it cannot be a zero sum game pakistan cannot afford to annoy one or please one and that is neither that's not our policy uh, also so i think we can keep a very uh, you know uh, sort of uh good balance if you if balance is the word i think which is light at this, uh, this i don't know this jargon or balance whatever so um it's a difficult uh act to perform but not impossible in my view well, most of the countries that which which countries want to align themselves with 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 what block or the other they work on the basis of mutual benefit if if i am getting advantage or benefit from a particular country obviously it is in my national interest to promote my relationship with that particular country very simple uh so i think i for one as far as coming back to su uh, pakistan has remained positively engaged and here i also want to say one thing uh coming to russia pakistan relations Russia also appreciates Pakistan's role in combating terrorism and Pakistan's importance in the region. China worked on Russia to improve relations with Pakistan. So look at how diplomacy works. So what does Moscow expect from Pakistan? Moscow 
expects from Pakistan that Pakistan will play a positive and a constructive role in stabilizing the region, in in uh, in given our influence on Afghanistan, which are, I don't know it is how much influence we have now on Taliban, but traditionally, yeah. so we will will control this uh, terrorism, uh, you know these things. Uh, this this uh, trends towards terrorism and extremism within the region, and we work on Afghanistan to to sort of water down their 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 thinking and whatever their policies, and also collaborate with Russia on controlling narcotics trafficking and all that. So, so Pakistan is quite uh, I think. Uh, Comfortably poised as against you know the doom and gloom, uh, which is aired from time to time about Pakistan's uh, you know prospects. I think Pakistan's prospects regionally are good, and I would even go to the extent of saying that if at some point in time, if India decides to change its mind uh, in terms of. Uh, Normalizing its relations with Pakistan and addressing issues, uh, uh, and and you know, looking towards this region instead of picking up fights with China, picking up fights with Pakistan, then I think this region can really become prosperous. Mr. Masood Khalid, thank you so much for your very candid and insightful uh, analysis, and benefiting our viewers uh, from your wisdom and assessment of SEO and helping us understand it better. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.